And here we have it, the inside of the Akai GX75. And these are professional standards. You don't want to take apart your hi-fi equipment on your bed unless you're a professional. As you can see, as we look inside, you may think, well, there is nothing special going on there. You have a circuit board, transformer, mechanism, that's it. Well, that's not it. This is basically the second floor. There is another circuit board underneath of here, underneath of this uh, metal part. So uh, that forms a nice metal box. So basically the complete audio circuitry is shielded from, uh, from the rest, from the power supply, from the mechanism, from the control circuitry. Very nice setup. There is another circuit board sitting underneath of this all. And that's, I believe, where all the uh, head amplifier circuitry, uh, the circuitry where the heads are being hooked up to, is sitting. It would make sense because, you know, as you can see, you probably already noticed, the mechanism is uh, sitting up quite high away from, from the bottom of the unit. That is, of course, because right there is another circuit board. And, uh, of course, hooking the heads up to that is a matter of a few centimeters. And other cassette decks that weren't designed that well, you sometimes have uh, like 20 centimeters of, uh, of thin wire running between the head and the circuitry, which is certainly not very good. Now, let's take a look at the mechanism. As you can see, this is really some quality right here. It is a, a three-motor mechanism, as usual. One of the motors drives the uh, the mechanical functions and uh, does not really have all too terribly much to do with the actual tape transport. We have the secondary motor for uh, driving the rails. Down there is where it's getting interesting. There it is. This is a very interesting part. This is the direct drive motor. As you can see, we have the coils sitting on the circuit board directly behind the flywheel and the flywheel is then basically also the motor. That's a very, very interesting setup right there. Now, uh, we uh, have, which is kind of hard to see, there we go. There is, of course, uh, another flywheel right there. This is one heck of a huge flywheel. And there is another pretty big one right there for the second capstan. They're both coupled together with a flat belt, which is in good condition. So uh, that's how that is working. Another sign for build quality is the way the pause mode has been set up. On many, many cheaper cassette decks, the pause is nothing else but stop. You just get all the electronics. All the electronics are being activated, but the mechanism is basically in the stop mode. The problem is that um, when you're going back from stop to uh, play back or record, uh, the cassette deck, the mechanism has to start up all the motors. So right after starting up, uh, you won't have a very stable speed. And that is not supposed to happen, because the purpose of the pause is to start into uh, whatever you may be doing, playback or record, with a stable speed. So that's really a sign for cheapness when it doesn't have a proper pause mode. Now this cassette deck has a different approach. And it's a very interesting, and uh, going by those standards, a very high quality one. Now, as you can see, I took off the door, the cassette door, to reveal the head assembly. There we have it. As you can see, we do have two capstans, two pinch rollers, obviously, some tape guides. This little thing right there is the erase head. And, uh, whoops, it has to be this so small because uh, obviously there are no big holes left in the cassette, so it's looking through one of these tiny little holes. Then, of course, we have the record playback head. There is the record side, there is the playback side. And there is a little piece to separate the two from each other. As you can see, the cassette deck has been turned off. If I now go ahead and turn it on, see what happens. Yep, <laughs> look at that. The pause mode is basically the default. As soon as I turn it on, it goes into pause mode, and uh, also all the capstans are spinning. See it down there? If I go ahead, eject it, you can see it pops back into the stop mode just for this process. I'm going to put in a cassette and 
close it. As you can see, there it is, back in pause mode. And obviously, this, uh, this is now going to start up in no time with a stable speed. That is the way this is supposed to be. Very, very good. And very, very quiet. Another sign for quality. However, there are two things that I can complain about. Being from the 90s, of course, uh, you know, producers tried to go a little cheaper back then, and uh, so this cassette deck, for as good as it is, as high quality as it is, unfortunately, the transformer is just an epic fail. It's completely underdimensioned. After running this cassette deck for like an hour or so, this thing really starts cooking. It's very annoying because, as you can see, there are holes, there are provisions for a much bigger transformer. I just put in this, uh, this small one. See, I just, I just turned the cassette deck on five minutes ago and it's already hot. Well, that's no good. At least it has been fused properly. So uh, when something goes wrong, it's not going to uh, blow up the transformer instantly. It's going to blow a fuse. And uh, also this thing right there, this poor little transistor, it's better not to touch it when the cassette deck is on because this thing is also getting very hot. It's of course one of those ridiculous typical 90s wannabe heat sinks. But that's basically all I can really find, these two little issues. So there you have it, the inside of the Akai GX75 cassette deck. I now want to put the cover back on, which uh, means that I'll have to put a ridiculous 13 screws back into place, just for this cover right there. So uh, that's also the reason why I didn't uh, took off the bottom to uh, reveal the other circuit boards I talked about, because I guess that's going to be quite a bit of a journey.